Who are the mysterious seven wise men from Edfu who came after the Great Flood and led the whole human civilization towards a new age? What is the role of ancient Egypt and the mighty gods? And how all this has been affecting us even in the present time? We will find out in the new episode of Secret Origins and part 2 of the story about the seven wise men from Edfu. Welcome. As we know, Thoth himself has played a huge role in the ancient legends about the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Over the centuries, he has been called by many names. Three times the Great, Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. He's even equated with Surit, Idris, or the Biblical Enoch. He often is depicted with the head of an ibis from the stork family, which of course is a sacred bird in Egypt. On one hand, to the ancient Egyptians, he was the guardian of the ancient wisdom, but on the other hand, he was looked upon as the lord of time. The library in his temple was very famous in Heliopolis. It is said that there was information about the secret tunnels on Papyri written by Thought himself. He had a few special items, as they called them, which helped him use the great power. These were for example a magic mirror in which he could see objects in a great distance. A listening and singing bird with whose help he learned all the news from far away and from the ancient inscriptions we understand that he himself came to earth with his ship as it is called. He had been assigned to administer justice when the gods and men multiplied to such an extent that regulations were needed and also praised his wisdom which he transcribed and organized the services and the sacrifice offerings. He taught people how to write and also the art of speech. He learned the servants how to take care of the palaces and temples of the gods and kings. And so nothing was forgotten by his wisdom, even the art of handicraft, weaving, braiding, hunting, agriculture and so on. Over time, Thaw was mixed with many other names but all conclusions lead to the same thing. Thoth and even Enoch are real entities from a very distant time who came to earth and brought people knowledge, culture and science. Enoch tells a lot about a life contact with God's Elohim, who we will discuss in other episodes and how he repeatedly left the earth with their flying machines. Thought himself tells something that's worth hearing. And of course, anyone can draw their own conclusion. There will come a time the Egyptians will pray to their gods in vain and all their sacraments will remain fruitless because the gods will have left Egypt and flew away from heaven. Egypt will be orphaned after it is abandoned by all its gods. Then in the country, foreign people will come and rule. They will prevent the Egyptians from carrying out the old worship services that they are used to and will punish those who are found secretly serving the old gods. Then that country, which was the most pious in the world, will become godless. Will be filled not with temples, but with tombs. Not with gods, but with corpses and the country will be depopulated. Not only from the gods, but also from the Egyptians. The oldest designation of the Egyptian goddess of the sky, Nut, is Mehet Veret, which means the great tide. However, outside of this exist many legends such as those of Harris Papyrus as well as the inscriptions in the temple of Edfu, which tell of the water calamity. A hieratic myth from the 13th century BC and translated in 1932 by Professor Alan Gardner also describes a high tide. As opposed to the Old Testament and the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Egyptian Noah, Utnapishtim, or the Chosen One to survive and lead humanity to Egypt, this time is the goddess of fertility, which in character resembles the deity Osiris. In order to restrain the violence of the sea, the goddess sends a bird that hurried to Isis. Then Isis decides to help and talk to her father Ptah. Finally, Ptah decided to calm the sea with the help of the god of the weather, Set. 
In this regard, it seems that the legacy of Pharaoh Ramses III regarding the Book of the Celestial Cow, a direct connection with the biblical legend of the Flood, with his published work in 1982, the Egyptian myth of the heaven cow, Professor Eric Hornung, provides the most understandable objective translation of this story. It begins during the Golden Age era when the gods still have watched directly over people. This is the time when people and gods were still united and lived in full harmony but for inexplicable reasons at some point harmony and the worship of the gods just ended. However, notice that the relationship was not violated by the gods but by us humans. In this direction of thought, we probably deserved the Great Flood. From the myth of Horus, we know about the period already mentioned the uprising of our ancestors that caused the Great Flood. Reportedly, 18,000 years BC at that time, the deity of Ra was already old and called for his help grandson Heru Behdeti. Horus rushed to come faster, then he defeated the demigods and the human enemies of Ra as from lower Nubia to the south to the sea coast up the north pushed out Ra's enemies from one battlefront to the other with a flying machine. Heru Behdedi flew to the horizon like a great winged sun, that is why he is still called the great god and lord of heaven. After he saw the enemies from heaven, he swooped in front of their faces a huge bee. He furiously aimed his sting against them, after that they could no longer see anything. At the meeting of the gods, it already had been decided that Horus could use people against people, another mysterious magical weapon called the Divine Eye of Ra open his eyes to exterminate those who have fought rivals against you. Nowadays, Egyptologists believe that the Eye of Ra is not only part of Ra's body, but according to the legends it was a separate being. There are legends according to which the Eye came into use to be an execution of an order to destroy enemies or to search for something in specific. From the Mesopotamian cuneiform we learn more interesting details of what happened. After the gods have created people in the Mesopotamian frame of mythology, of course, life flowed in constant harmony and everything was wonderful. But the brother of Ea, Enlil, who was from the very beginning against the artificial creation of humans in the time of the Golden Age, suspiciously resigned. When few of the divine retinue also began to form intersexual relationships with the human daughters, and they were the last straw. Enlil and Ra in the Egyptian mythology called the Council of the Gods, where they publicly complained. The country expanded and the people increased, multiplying like wild bulls. Their multiplication angered God. God Enlil heard their words and said to the great gods, unpleasant are people's words, their multiplication stole my sleep. And that coincidence, a lot of the history of Sumerian civilization for their Anunnaki gods. If you haven't watched the Anunnaki episode, there will be a link in the description. Watch it so that you can make connections. It's very interesting. In the beginning, not the Great Flood was the one that befell people, but the contagious diseases that caused pain and fever. People prayed to God Ea, who can be identified as God Ra for his help. Ea, O Lord, mankind, groans. The wrath of the gods destroys the country, but you are the one who created us. Put an end to the suffering of disease, of fever. In any case, Ra initially destroys the destructive plan of Set against the people, similarly to Horus in the Egyptian version, causes several events. However, this has made Enlil even angrier and he again complained to the great gods. People do not decrease, their number is more than ever. In his second plan, which this time he realized with the help of the Great Ones, Enlil tries to destroy humans with thrust and hunger, which lasts seven years. 
During these tough times, people went so wild that they began to stalk their only friend Diet Ra and even attacked him but despite the damage, Ra soon realized that people could do nothing against the divine powers. That made him so sad, he even cried. It got to the point that even Ia himself urged people to no longer submit to the gods. Imagine what it would be like if we lived in that time. Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets even give us astronomical indication of the time of the Great Flood, which in contrast from the Egyptian legend stated that about a thousand years earlier. The constellation Lion measured the water of waters. This corresponds to the period of the great melting of the glaciers that took place at the end of the last ice age and it's confirmed by today's science. When the flood ended, most of humanity had died out and written testimonies of ancient times were gone. The few survivors fell into the face of primitiveness, which initially started with cannibalism and they again tried to stay to the water as hunters and gatherers. A very interesting experiment that is more than 2600 years old carried out ancient Egypt shows that the children who were isolated go wild and without human intervention they can't learn to speak. In the 7th century BC, the pharaoh Psamtik I commanded two newborn children to be closed and be carried for by a shepherd for two years, however, he wasn't allowed to talk to them. Two years later, the children could say a single word and that was the word Bekus, which means bread. For the pharaoh, that the primary language of mankind was Phrygian, though the children apparently imitated only the bleating of the sheep. In the first volume, chapters 1 and 5, the historian Diodorus of Sicily deals with the elimination of cannibalism, which also remained in the primitive population of the Nile Valley. At that distant time, man was still a primitive creature, and the gods unlearned the humans to eat each other. The gods in question here are the well-known messengers of the culture that suddenly reappear and bring new after the flood civilizations. And these seven personalities that could be found in almost every culture, their appearance coincidence with the creation of the dynasty of thought, where the Egyptian god chooses seven priest scholars and trusts them the divine knowledge as a result of which they become sages. From the Egyptian book of Hell 1 and 3, we learn that the first one of these seven sages is called Osiris, while the other six seem to have names of fish. This points to a meeting with the culture of the African Dogon people. The second of these mysterious sages entities bears the name of Mogul type and number four the name also meaning catfish. For the fifth and the seventh the common name for fish is used while the names of third and the sixth cannot be clearly identified. Furthermore, there are seven sages not only in Egypt with Noah among the Mesoamerican peoples for example, but also with the Hindus as well as with the Babylonians, all of whom appear after a great flood and bring the new culture with them. They are always responsible for the new beginning and in the Hindus they are called Rishis, in Babylonians the word is Apkalu. Apkalu is an approximate translation of the great one that leads us. The older Sumerian designation of these sages is Apgab, which means a master who shows the path. It is interesting that the only model of Egyptian drone preserved until today is stored and locked in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's from the 3rd century BC and was opened on May 12, 1898 by French archaeologists in Sahara. This model of an airplane carries the inscription of Padi Imen, which means approximately a gift from the sages. What is constantly missed by modern researchers in regards to the Mesoamerican messengers of culture is the nickname of these mysterious visitors, 
Ah Roja Lak, which can be translated as Master of the Great Flat Shell. And here comes the interesting question. Are these UFO-like flying ships? In the Egyptian Book of Dead, Aphorism 17209 says that the Supreme God Ra who is in the egg, Ra who swims in his heavenly shell. Yet, something interesting in ancient Egypt, the word Sehem is a symbol of power through which were observed stars called in ancient Egyptian texts the beings between the gods and the people. Sahem is repeatedly described as a separate being who stands on the same level as the gods. The function of this subject for modern Egyptologists to this day remains a mystery, although some believe that exactly there is hidden the key to Galileo Galilei's cosmic observations. They interpreted Sahem only like an ordinary ruler sceptre without taking into account account the power that according to legend lives in the wand in question and it's not just a stick that symbolizes the power of the ruler. Because of the power to see hidden in Sehem can be explained one of the nicknames of Osiris which is the great Sehem who lives in heavens. In his book the Last Judgment Began Long Ago by Eric von Däniken reveals the possibilities that we've been visited in the past by representatives of alien civilization. Such a possibly for some seems quite great fiction, but for others it is an obvious fact. He says the following. We do the same but not in a genetic way that we are only now taking on but in a way of selection. We have bred Swiss and German cows which are now grazing in the tropical climate of Kenya. We mix the breeds of oxen to get more sustainable cows with higher milk. We crossed sheep and goats. We raised and mixed varieties of rapeseed, wet and other plants to adapt them to their new environment. And today we're just about to produce varieties of vegetables genetically. And God knows more what will come to our scientists in this field. And whether suddenly we won't find a genetic path creating a man who will live 240 years. That's how hybrid monsters emerged, creatures like no other on the globe. People spoke exceedingly about them. They were amazed, feared the divine creatures and after they died or were destroyed by the flood, the horrible animals immediately moved in the people's memory, turned into myths and legends told of distant times when the gods created hybrids. Around 80% of mythology of the ancient Aztecs, Indians, Sumerians, Egyptians, Maya, Assyrians, Indians, South American civilizations and so on depict the same captivating story about alien gods who create the man and take care of his survival. The common between them is that there is a creation, that is existence and cycles of the earthly orb, each of them ending in a devastating cataclysm that is needed for all human civilization so that it can pass to the next stage of its development. The great gods according to the ancient descended from the sky to extract the most durable electrolyte metal known in chemistry as gold. Egypt called the gold the skin of the gods. They who descended to earth then created a man. In Sumer, their written evidence of the creation of man to be a worker in their gold mines. It turns out according to some people that the most ancient gold mines and even the most ancient rulers are in Bulgaria. The creation of the cosmic order is precisely the beginning of time, it is when the calendar was born. In the Balkans there is such a calendar which is located in Magura cave. The images dating from the 8th to 9th century BC and according to the Spaniards they are over 9000 years old and have their analogies with drawings from prehistoric centers in Italy, the Iberian peninsula and from Asia. 
Ancient Babylonian legend tells that the seven sages have lived before the Great Flood and erected the walls of the sacred city of Uruk. According to Sumerian civilization, En Mendurana is the seventh king prior to the Flood who ruled in Sippar for a period of six rounds on the planet Nibiru before becoming a high priest and receiving the name En Mendur Anki. We know of the planet Nibiru and the Sumerian civilization which claim to have received all their knowledge and technology thanks to the Anunnaki which came exactly from this planet. In the book of Enoch the same king is named Uriel who reveals to Enoch the secrets of the sun and the laws of the moon and finally Uriel gives him the heavenly plates by guiding him to study them very carefully and thoughtfully. The interesting thing is that when we come across the seven sages in different ancient myths they are always enlightened and have survived a huge cataclysm which destroyed almost the entire planet and then they built the foundation foundations of the new age of mankind. In addition to all of this, the inscriptions in Edfu say that they came from a small island where the first people lived, but they fled from there because of the Great Flood. Most of the residents drowned and the few survivors settled in Egypt as they did turn in to the gods builders who worked in this ancient time. Extremely strange and somehow admirable is that these stories are so jumbled and yet they lead us to the same conclusion. That the ancients knew a lot more than us and no matter what names they were called by, it is a fact that and to this day we talk, argue and take an interest in them proves that they managed to preserve this knowledge. In what form of course and to what extent we cannot be sure, but ancient writings like the Emerald Tablets, the Book of Enoch, the Book of People, Gods and Heops and many others suggest that our civilization is much stronger and more powerful than it is presented today and that we really have a huge role in the history of the creation of the whole universe. What do you think about the seven wise men from Edfu? We'll be happy to read and discuss with you down in the comments below. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Keep your minds open and until we meet again.